high clock speed, low latency, enable PBO, overclock it? I'm going to try to answer all of that, but the answers are a little weird. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and if you caught my last video, you know I sat in line at Micro Center all night to get this Ryzen 5 5600X. I brought it home and I ran almost 40 benchmarks and shared all the data with y'all. Now, when I compiled all the data and started plugging it into the charts, I noticed, and some of you noticed, that the results were a bit underwhelming. Now, the 5600X outperformed the R5 3600X and the R7 3700X I tested it against, but not by the margin some other reviewers saw. Now, I conjectured the reason may be because my Asus Prime X570 Pro has Precision Boost Overdrive enabled by default. So all three CPUs were tested with PBO enabled. Now, just FYI, once I realized this, I might have could have retested, but first, I'd been up for about 48 hours. Second, I assumed because PBO was on across the board while testing, I was still looking at an apples to apples comparison. And finally, and most importantly, I don't have the 3600X anymore. I borrowed it from someone, marathon benchmark session, and then gave it back. But now, because I'm me, I needed to find out exactly if my educated guess that, that PBO was much more effective on the Zen 2 CPU than it was on the new Zen 3 was correct, I also started hearing the rumblings about how there were much bigger swings in review results from different reviewers with this launch. Now, there are many possible reasons for this, but as long as the only variable changed across all testing is the subject, in this case, the CPU, the testing should be valid. So it's possible one reviewer finds the 5600X say outperforms the 10900K based on the test parameters they used while another finds it trails the 10900K based on other test parameters. You have to look at the entire test overall. You can't just compare FPS numbers on one person's chart to FPS numbers on another's chart. That's not how it works. Anyway, the one variable that I focused on as a potential reason for such a big swing in results this time was memory. I thought I might look at how the 5600X performs across different memory speeds and latency. So today I'm going to see how strictly stock settings versus precision boost overdrive versus auto overclocking versus manual overclocking the 5600X affects its performance, then I'm going to see how performance scales with memory speed and latency. So I'm just going to start with the charts here and just a heads up, the results get a bit weird, but hang on and I'll do my best to explain at the end. Also, for those who thought all my results were completely flawed because my BIOS was like two weeks old, I installed the latest beta BIOS for all this testing and it made no difference. But to see the charts, hit that like button within five seconds. Does that even work? My kids told me I should do that. I don't know. They know more about YouTube than me. I just did it for them. If you like it, just like it. I don't know. Anyway, here are the charts. So the first thing is this busy chart here that shows CPU benchmark results at stock settings with PBO enabled. And this time I disabled the motherboard PBO and enabled it in Ryzen Master. I also tested the Ryzen Master auto overclock setting, as well as the Asus performance enhancer overclock setting in the BIOS. Now, I did do some manual overclocking, but there aren't any results, and I'll explain more at the end. The benchmarks used here were the Firestrike physics only test and the Time Spy CPU test, the Passmark CPU mark test, V Ray benchmark, and Cinebench R20. Like I said, this chart is a bit busy. Feel free to pause if you want to study the individual scores, but in order to visualize the results better, I just combined the scores for each setting and graphed it out. Now you can see the biggest jump in performance is going from stock settings to PBO with a 6.7% performance boost, but from there we get less than 1% gains as we'll see shortly the auto overclock only boosts frequencies by a mere 100 MHz over PBO. Next is another busy chart 
showing the same thing, but this time for gaming performance. The four titles I selected this time, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Horizon Zero Dawn, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and CSGO are more CPU dependent or balanced titles and should show us gains as CPU performance increases. But here we're technically looking at a statistical dead heat in every title. All the tests fall within margin of error, which for my benchmarking is five frames per second. For game benchmarking, if a run doesn't fall within five FPS of the other runs, I toss that run and do it again. The final number is an average of all the runs. So since all the results for each title are within five FPS, they're statistically the same. Many reviewers will just normalize this data by just averaging the results and listing them all as the same number, like this. But instead, I again combine the FPS results and graphed it out. So if we forego the strict statistics, we'll see that there may be some performance gain over stock settings, but going from stock to level three performance enhancer gives us a whopping 1% gain overall, but probably not even that because, well, statistics. So we saw some measurable gains in CPU performance, but it didn't translate into gaming gains. Why? Well, it's because AMD wasn't exaggerating when they said the Zen 3 architecture was optimized for gaming, or probably it's the microcode and boost tables are optimized for gaming. Let me demonstrate. But first, let me apologize for the video quality I'm about to share. My workstation, which is also my capture system, is in pieces behind the camera at the moment for my next video, which I need to start tomorrow. So I had to do the whole point the camera at the monitor to get screen caps for this one. Not great, but it works. So here, the CPU is at stock, Cinebench is running, and the cores are boosting to around 4100 megahertz. This is about how all the productivity benchmarks ran at stock. Some boosted a little higher, some bounced around more, but basically none hit 4.6 gigahertz for any extended amount of time. Now, when I enable PBO in Ryzen Master, the frequencies boost much higher in Cinebench and all the productivity benchmarks up to 4.65 gigahertz in some, which is why we saw gains. In both the auto OC setting and by enabling basically the same thing in BIOS. Clocks boosted to 4.75 gigahertz, so like a 150 megahertz all core OC, not bad, but it didn't really get us any gains, but it did get us more heat up to like 88 degrees Celsius during Cinebench, as opposed to just 65 C at stock. Now, if games perform the same way, we should see some gains, but they don't. This is Horizon Zero Dawn benchmark. The CPU is at stock settings and you see the cores are boosting much higher than Cinebench did and maintaining the boost up to 4.65 gigs. So now let's look again with PBO enabled and we can see that we are maintaining a 4.65 gigahertz boost on all cores for the entire benchmark. But in the end, this didn't change the score. Why? Well, let's go over the things we saw here. First, for our production benchmarks, there was a significant difference between boost clocks from stock to PBO. This is likely because the instructions, most significantly the AVX instructions the CPU has to process in Cinebench, are much more punishing on the CPU. They require more power, which generates more heat, and the CPU has to operate within its TDP, basically. So the boost tables for these types of instructions seem to be pretty conservative. Now, for gaming, the instructions aren't that power hungry, so the CPU can do them faster while staying within its parameters. The cores were able to boost to 4.65 gigs, but they did that very efficiently. Only the cores that were actually being used at the moment were boosted, while others dropped all the way down to 3.1 gigahertz. This is where we see the efficiency of this architecture. So because the cores that needed the speed got the speed when they needed it, our FPS was optimized. When enabling PBO, all cores boost to 4.65 gigahertz, but that's not benefiting cores that don't need 4.65 gigs of speed, it's just wasting power. 
This is way more efficient than Zen 2. Zen 2 rarely even hit its max boost clock while gaming on any core. Not without PBO or some BIOS enabled motherboard enhancement on. It's almost like AMD baked PBO right into the CPU instruction set and made it better. As far as the auto overclock setting, this boosted all cores to 4.75 GHz, but this extra 100 MHz over the stock boost clocks didn't get us any more performance. Now, as far as manual overclocking, I did try a little, and since auto OC already got me to 4.75 gigs, that's where I started, but I wasn't able to get anything stable over that. Now, if I had more time, maybe, but we already know that Zen 2 had almost no headroom for overclocking, and I'm sure there's even less in Zen 3, and because of the even more efficient boost tables, I assume manually overclocking will probably hinder gaming performance. So let's move on to memory. Now to test memory scaling, I tested from 4,000 megahertz down to 3,600 megahertz at CL18 and from 3,800 megahertz down to 3,200 megahertz at CL16. I also kept the memory clock ratios at a one to one to one ratio which is possible with Zen 3 up to like 4,000 megahertz now. And we see all the results here for CPU performance. If you wanna study those results, hit pause because I'm moving on to the combined results and this is where the real weirdness starts. Because you can see it looks like the best performance is at 3,200 megahertz CL16 with 4,000 megahertz performing the worst. Now, for context, the total performance spread here is only 3%, but it looks like the line is going the wrong way. Now, we can see latency still is a factor with 3,800 MHz CL16 outperforming 3,800 CL18 and 3,600 MHz CL16 besting the same speed at cast latency 18. But why would 3,200 CL16 be better than 3,800 CL16? I'll explain it, but... Let's look at gaming memory scaling, and again, here there really isn't a big difference, at least not what I expected there to be, considering the chatter about the perceived review discrepancies. And for more weirdness, look at the combined results. The line is opposite of our CPU performance scaling. 3200 MHz is now the lowest, but lower latency still has an edge, and again, there's only a 3% margin across the entire data set. Now, what did all that mean? Why did those lines go in opposite directions? How can gaming performance fall if CPU performance rises? Well, it has to do with the relation of the CPU boost frequencies and memory speeds. This is Cinebench running stock CPU settings, memory at 3800 MHz CL18, and the cores boost to 4.1-ish. But here, the same CPU settings, but the memory up to 4000 MHz and the boost clocks don't get up to 4.1. Basically, for every 100 megahertz I added to the memory clocks, the CPU clocks reduced by about 25 megahertz. Because remember, I'm not just overclocking the memory modules, I'm overclocking the CPU, because the Infinity Fabric and Memory Controller are part of the CPU, and again, the CPU has a power limit to operate in, so if I add power to one part of the CPU, it needs to offset that, and it does that by reducing core clock. Now, because the CPU architecture is so efficient in gaming, like I just showed you, this offset doesn't affect performance, or if it does, it's less of a hit than the gains from the faster memory. So what does all this tell us? Do you need to enable PBO for gaming? What's the memory sweet spot? Well, first, PBO doesn't seem to be as important as it was in previous generations for gaming. It looks to me like AMD incorporated PBO-like boost tables into the CPU itself. For production tasks or like content creation, PBO may give you some uplift, but still under 10%. As far as the memory sweet spot, well, my testing was limited to what I have available, but just from that data, I'd say the sweet spot is still a DDR4 3600 MHz CL16 kit. 
while the 3800 CL16 did beat it by one frame, the non-gaming results are better at 3600. But good news here, if you have a 3200 megahertz kit like this $60 Corsair kit, you really don't need to upgrade it for the Ryzen 5 5600X, right away anyway. Of course, lower latency is better, but not as much as it used to be. I think they really did improve memory latency here, and it's also expensive. You want CL14, you're gonna pay for it. And I don't ever recommend spending more on your RAM than your CPU. Or you can tune your memory to a lower latency, but that's a whole different video. I'll link the G-Skill kit I used for testing. It's a 3600 CL16 kit, but I was able to easily run it at 3800 CL16. This Corsair 4000 megahertz CL18 kit, though it runs fine, didn't give me any performance improvement. So I'd say a 4000 megahertz kit isn't worth the money. Not, in, not on this CPU anyway. Okay, finally, here are some revised benchmarks comparing the 5600X to the 3700X using our new optimal settings. Default CPU settings and the 3600CL16 memory. Not all 18 again, but this is the cherry pick titles that are lean CPU heavy or balanced. While there are gains of 20% in Tomb Raider, 16% in Horizon Zero Dawn, which are very CPU heavy, a balanced title like Breakpoint sees a more moderate 10% gain, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which does actually take advantage of the 8 cores on the 3700X, only gets an 8% bump. I also retested Warzone, thanks to Nada from Tech Testers for posting the video on the simple fix, and now I'm seeing a 9% gain over the 3700X. The only outlier here is CSGO with only about a 3% improvement. I know that others have seen higher gains, but that's what I got. Overall, there was a 10% improvement over the 3700X. Now, I still stand by my original results. If PBO is enabled on a Ryzen 3000 CPU, there are measurable improvements to FPS in most games, while there's just not with Ryzen 5000 as I just demonstrated. So simply clicking PBO on will close those margins on that last chart I showed you. Also, while testing CPU dependent games for a CPU review is pretty much standard practice to fully demonstrate the CPU's potential, I try not to do that. I'd rather try to show how the CPU will improve or not improve your gaming experience overall. I'll typically include titles that lean more on the GPU and some that are balanced between CPU and GPU use. The point I make to people who ask why is it's for that guy who's excited about season seven of like Apex Legends and wants to up his game and he sees this new 5600X is 20% better in games than his 3600, so he drops 300 bucks for it, only to learn that it has no effect on his FPS. So he'd have been better off spending the money on a new GPU. Okay, final thing for those who are convinced for some reason that six cores isn't enough for gaming, I don't know what to tell you. Snap out of it. I mean, four cores was all we had for gaming just like yesterday. Now all of a sudden six cores isn't enough. Yes, games are starting to take advantage of more cores and multi-threading, but they don't need it. A faster CPU will still beat a slower CPU with more cores. I mean, I just did it. And stop telling them about the eight core consoles. The Xbox Series X will have a slower version of the eight core Zen 2 CPU I just beat with this six core CPU. Anyway, I explain how it works in an earlier video about four core CPUs, you can check it out. Okay, this is my second 48 hour marathon session this week, so that's it for this one. If you made it this far, you obviously liked it, so show it by hitting that like button and maybe consider subscribing. If you have any questions ask, I always answer unless it's can i have a computer okay good night guys stay safe and i hope to catch you in the next one